Ukrainian over to you, Pan. Thank you, Katrina, so much. And uh, colleagues, it's a pleasure to join you in this webinar on mental health and psychosocial uh, aspects of radiation and nuclear uh, emergencies. Uh, it's a very, uh, it's a very important uh, topic, and uh, it reflects the content of uh, an existing WHO uh, uh, framework on this uh, on this topic. I'm asking my good colleague uh, Katerina uh, or Yulia to please share the link to the framework either in its Ukrainian uh, version here in the chat here in the chat function. But let me start by introducing myself. My name is Fami Handa. I am the co-chair of the Interagency Standing Committee Reference Group on Mental Health and Psychosocial Support in Emergencies, and I am based at WHO headquarters in uh, in Geneva at the Department of Mental Health and Substance Use. And together with my colleague from WHO, Janatkar, we co-authored with a group of experts this uh, this framework. I want to give the floor to Janat to introduce uh, to introduce herself, please. And then Jeanette take us through the first uh, the first few slides in in the PowerPoint presentation. I'll put the PowerPoint presentation for you, Jeanette. Thank you, thank you, Fahmi. Hello, everybody. My name is Jeanette. Um, as Fahmi already mentioned, I work at the Radiation and Health Program at the headquarters in Geneva. And um, by training, I'm a radiation oncologist, so I don't know much about psychological and mental health issues, but. Uh, with Fahmi's help, we managed to put together this very nice document, which we are very happy to introduce to you today. Um, okay, I wasn't sure which version you have, <laughs> Fahmi, but okay, this version is fine. Okay, let's uh, go to the first slide. I think first we usually are talking about the definition of health of WHO. Usually when I present the framework, I start from the definition of um, WHO, which includes not merely absence of disease, but also a well-being. So mental health is incorporated in the overall understanding of what is health. And there is also a definition of mental health, which I would have had on my first slide, but because it's a different version of presentation, maybe Fahmi, you can give us a definition of mental health. What does it say? That the person should be able to contribute to the society? How does it go? I, I want to share, Jeanette, with your permission, with colleagues, uh, the definition of mental health and psychosocial support, which is more close to the context we are using here, which is a protection and promotion of psychosocial uh, well-being, any intervention for protection and promotion of psychosocial well-being, as well as any intervention for prevention and treatment of mental health condition. And really, by using this definition, we have combined wide range of actors who work under different sectors, not only health sector or protection sector, but even camp management, nutrition, and uh, and uh, and uh, as 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 well as shelter and wash and other other sectors sectors as as well. And this definition is extremely relevant because uh, because uh, some of the studies that happened in uh, in, in Chernobyl uh, has shown that not necessarily all the survivors have what is known as pathological uh, diagnoses as identified in ICD-10 by depression or anxiety or PTSD or others, but many has uh, has had either things such as misuse of substance or risky behavior among young uh, young people due to a sense of uh, of collective fatality or or we are going to die any 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 anyway. So that's why we are not talking about diagnosis only. We are talking actually about wide range of uh, of distress. Back to you, Jenna. Thank you. Thank you, Fahmi. So this slide uh, basically breaks down uh, the definition. Uh, the first slide was showing the definition of MHPSS, mental health and, and psychosocial support, which is composed of two very important elements. First of all, is protecting and promoting psychosocial well-being, and second is preventing and treating mental health condition, clinical conditions. Next slide, please. So what we were facing, the situation in the preparedness and response to radi radiological and nuclear emergencies, is that the system of uh, preparedness and response is based actually on the um, radiological measurable quantities and uh, concepts. So all we have international norms and standards for um, triggering protective actions in radiation emergencies, they are based on radiation exposure and doses. 
And however, when we talk about uh, such soft concepts as psychosocial well-being, how can we measure those? Although we know the previous nuclear accidents, both Chernobyl reports and Fukushima accident reports, they demonstrate and they provide a very strong evidence that mental health and psychosocial impact of these accidents was actually over, it, it overweighed, it, it prevailed in terms of um, health conditions and health uh, impacts. So they were not related directly due to radiation exposure, but due to the stress related to the protective actions, to the uh, interventions, for example, to the sheltering, to the evacuation, for dis displacement of populations, long-term displacement, as for example happened in the Chernobyl. And um, so there is actually a, a big system of guidance is developed um, by WHO, by the interagency cluster, uh, what Fahmi has mentioned earlier. So there is a plethora of guidance available for natural disasters, for health outbreaks, for humanitarian emergencies, but we do not have similar guidance. We did not have similar guidance, which could apply for nuclear emergency situations. Next slide, please. So having this in mind, WHO has teamed up with the Nuclear Energy Agency, which is part of OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, several years ago. And we put together a joint project, which consisted of two parts. The phase one included development of a policy framework based on the existing WHO and Interagency Standing Committee guidelines on mental health in emergencies. And we adopted these uh, existing guidelines and uh, norms and regulations to the nuclear accident scenarios and situations. Uh, we successfully published it, and you, you have a link here to the video uh, of the similar webinar we held uh, at the moment of launch of the framework. And Professor Mazahar um, Maeda also participated in that um, webinar. The second phase is now being implemented by Nuclear Energy Agency. Based on the WHO framework, they are developing a derivative products, practical tools for efficient implementation of the framework. And these are checklists for decision makers, a special decision making matrix, and uh, they're collecting uh, case studies from successful implementation of uh, the framework in uh, different emergency situations and countries. Um, so this work is supposed to end, uh, it's coming close to the end, uh, by the end of this year. I think we now go to the framework presentation and Fahmi will take the lead here. Thank you. Thank you, Janat. With your permission, I'll I'll cover the remaining slides, but from every now and then I'll get back to you with some questions and points for inputs from your side, from radiation, radiation expertise sites. Uh, before, at the end of the presentation, we go to Professor Maida from Fukushima Medical University for some inputs on the, specifically on the experience in, in after the Fukushima plant uh, emergency. Colleagues, I see in the chat our good colleague Yulia has shared uh, has shared the the framework in its Ukrainian version. Uh, I encourage you if you haven't read it to download and read it. In the field of mental health and psychosocial support during the last two decades, we were very active in humanitarian response. We were also very active in building back better after emergencies. But in general, in the field of mental health and psychosocial support, we were not active in the area of preparedness. When using WHO Mental Health Atlas, we asked countries, are you integrating mental health and psychosocial support in your disaster preparedness plans? Only 25% of countries around the world, of member states of WHO, only 25% responded positively that mental health and psychosocial support is part of preparedness. This document, while it includes guidance on the three different components of the emergency cycle related to radiation emergency, including preparedness, including response, and including recovery, 
It is written very much with preparedness kept in mind. It's a document that we wrote while we are hoping it will be only used for preparedness and, and the world would never need to use it for response because we know the scale and the death toll and the tragedies associated with such, uh, with such emergencies. But preparedness is extremely important and WHO aim to uh, to have or the member states agreed that 80% uh, of countries will have mental health and psychosocial support integrated into their emergency preparedness plan but one of the of the possible risk is nuclear and radiation emergencies before this framework nuclear and radiation scientists would rarely talk to mental health and psychosocial support expert except in specific emergencies as we will hear later from professor maida from Japan. We tried to build terminology. We tried through the two and a half years of process of developing this guidance to merge and, uh, and, uh, and, and build this framework using the learned lessons from both, both fields. But why specifically we need a framework? Why radiation and nuclear emergencies are so unique? There are many aspects related to the, the non-radiation impact of radiation and nuclear emergencies. First, we know from literature that actually the mental health and psychosocial support impacts can sometimes outweigh actually the radiation and physical impact of radiation and nuclear emergencies. And uh, and and if you if you quantify it, I mean rumors and uh, and uh, and uh, false information about a nuclear emergency can reach people even far from the effect the place in close proximity to the affected affected area and affect even those who have not been directly affected. But for those who have been directly affected, there are specific vulnerable groups from the first responders to the to the plant uh, personnel to the cleanup uh, personnel to personnel involved in evacuation if there is uh, evacuation host community where the evacuees get evacuated uh, evacuated uh, evacuated to parents of children because the impacts of radiation sometimes tend to be long term so there can be worry and anxiety from from the parents of children and some also vulnerable groups uh, such as older uh, older adults uh, and people living with disabilities or with mental disorders at the affected at the affected sites. Radiation we don't see, and the impact of radiation does not appear immediately after radiation radiation incident. And that what keeps something mysterious and unique for radiation emergencies that you don't see its impact. And that leads to risk communication challenges because it's something you don't see and you don't see its impact immediately, it leaves a space for, for rumors and for false information. And we all know since COVID-19, how, how, how this uh, can have a negative, a negative, a negative impact during a, a, large, a large emergency. While talking to radiation and nuclear scientists, we discovered we have some commonalities in both areas. Uh, colleagues, there are also stigma related to people affected by radiation. Save the children back in 2012 in an assessment done in Fukushima is telling us about bullying of children affected uh, affected by affected by by the Fukushima incident. Uh, women in childbearing age sometimes try to deny uh, their their link to a place affected uh, affected by a radiation emergency because they might be stigmatized because of the a genetic effect of radiation or their impact on future on future pregnancies. Even I, I hope also Dr. Maida will, will tell us also more about that. There, there were associated stigmatizing terms related to, to people affected by Hiroshima and Nagasaki emergency. So it's not only mental disorders, but even in radiation fields, we noticed we noticed there is also issues related to stigma that need to be addressed through good risk, uh, risk communication. Not necessarily people working in radiation who are different cats are trained on mental health and psychosocial support uh, support support aspects, and that also leave us leave us with a big gap. Uh, something also many people do not expect: we have displacements due to radiation. We have impact on economy because the land can can be left, and people need to leave their shops. And impact on economy in affected affected area, either area is really affected or affected due to false information. But also nuclear emergencies themselves have a specific political nature, where in many situations either the local authorities get criticized or those who are 
managing a plant, and we know that uh, during uh, during the Chernobyl incident, where where there can be mistrust between the local population and authorities, and that also come with some challenges on communication and community engagement. These are some of the unique issues related to, to the mental health impacts of radiation and nuclear emergencies. They're really nicely covered in the framework. I encourage you to go to go and read it. But we developed what is known in the in the framework as the five C's model. Five C's model is what you need to do cross-cutting while you are responding across the three phases: preparedness, response, and recovery for a nuclear emergency. You need to do coordination, you need to do communication. You need to do capacity building, you need to do community engagement and apply core ethical principles. Coordination in the field of radiation and nuclear emergencies is like other emergencies. It needs to be cross-cutting across all sectors and building on existing coordination mechanisms such as the mental health and psychosocial support technical working group. It's not a matter of health sector only, you need to engage education, shelter, WASH and others while you are developing and implementing mental health and psychosocial support intervention. But noting the scale of radiation and nuclear emergencies, you need also to involve clear function lines of communication, clear operating procedures, and agreed roles and responsibilities while doing coordination for this specific type of emergencies. When it comes to communication, WHO will have a clear guidance on emergency risk communication strategies. And it is a well-known fact is that good communication about protective strategies in radiation emergencies also, also help people uh, help people to, to cope. And I want to invite Jeanette to give us more clarification here. What are the protective measures you usually do uh, at the beginning of radiation emergencies, Jeanette, if you may, please? Um, well, if you're talking about uh, protective measures, of course, it is very important to inform potentially affected population uh, about what may be happening in case of a nuclear emergency. For example, when we talk about, um, uh, let's say, the Parisia, which is now um, is in a very unstable situation, and we've been all looking very, watching very closely at the, the situation around it. Um, there are um, in the vicinity of the nuclear power plant, there are residential, of course, areas, and uh, there is a city in Arhoda, which is, as you know, uh, hosts is a home of uh, people working at that facility, and some other uh, settlements in, in the the nearest set settlements to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. So the residents of those areas and uh, of other uh, residents around other nuclear installations in Ukraine, um, they are normally uh, covered by a special uh, uh, strategy for communication. And uh, the company which operates a nuclear installation, they are under the licensing agreement, they are obliged to conduct communication activities, to inform people, and also to conduct exercises, emergency exercises. So not talking about a, a war, ongoing war, but in, uh, let's say, in a civil, uh, in any country, in a civil uh, conditions, um, the nuclear operators will be always actively engaged with local communities in the nearest settlements. And they will be informing um, the local authorities about anything going on uh, out of order in the nuclear installation. And they will be providing um, assistance with uh, potassium iodide pill distribution, um, with evacuation, and um, also conducting some uh, educational activities uh, for the local communities at schools, for example, or colleges, etc. So this is an example how um, nuclear power plants operators engaged with community in the preparedness phase. Thank you. Very helpful, Jeanette. Thank you. And I move to the third C, which is about community engagement. And when it comes to community engagement, like what the ISC guidelines on MHPSS is telling us, those who are affected by emergency, they need to be uh, uh, leaders and participating in the emergency response uh, actively, including in mental health and psychosocial support. 
and also we work with local community leaders from the affected communities. This is relevant for all emergencies, but colleagues, this is even more relevant for radiation and nuclear emergencies, which as we mentioned earlier, there is sometimes a sense of mistrust between those who are affected by the emergency and those who are either responsible for the plant or those who are uh, who are responsible for the humanitarian response by thinking that that uh, that the responders might be trying to minimize or miscommunicate about the true real impact of the emergency so community engagement is of particular importance importance here and then the fourth c is capacity building who should be trained on image basis? Everyone in the humanitarian response need to be trained on something. Those who work at the plant need to be trained on stress management tools, even as part of their preparedness. Those who are engaged in the first line need to be trained on basic psychosocial skills. Health workers in affected areas need to be trained on tools such as Image Gap Humanitarian Intervention Guide to be able to identify a range of priority mental health, uh, mental health conditions. And when it comes to core ethics, we apply human rights as a core principle in all response to emergencies, equally to this emergency as well. And care really must be uh, must be ensured to 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 prioritize the community needs and protection from exploitation, abuse, and discrimination, and to respect the culture and local values of affected affected population. Colleagues, many of you are mental health and psychosocial support experts. There are numerous resources in this area of work and uh, and with a very active image pieces technical working group in ukraine we have all image pieces resources from who and the interagency standing committee on image pieces available in ukrainian language so i encourage my colleague katrina and my colleague yulia to share the links with you to some of the key resources on image pieces that would be relevant for this group because i know we have participants from other sectors but what represent a minimum for a response in mass emergency is summarized now also by WHO in the minimum service package for mental health and uh, psychosocial support, which is planned to be released as an IC product by the next year. And finally, a very good training module is available in the open WHO course and available also dubbed in Ukrainian language on the same uh, platform. It's a specific module of a training course on image pieces, but actually have a very nice module on radiation and nuclear emergencies by my colleague Janat. I'm going to stop this slide set here and going to introduce to you, and we are really, really lucky to have uh, Professor Masaharu Maida from the Fukushima Medical University School of Medicine in Fukushima, Japan. And Professor Maida is a professor and chair of the Department of Disaster Psychiatry at the Fukushima Medical University School of Medicine in Japan. And he play a leading role in the response to the mental health aspects of Fukushima emergency and has numerous uh, well-renowned literature about this area, about this area of work and about his response to Fukushima. So I invite you, Professor Maida, to give us some, some insights and learned, learned lessons, please, from the Fukushima response that hopefully we can apply to, to Ukrainian preparedness as well. Over to you. Thank you uh, for your uh, introduction to me. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Masaru Maeda uh, from Fukushima University. Uh, and, uh, I'm in charge of the uh, major uh, veteran service for uh, the affected people uh, from the uh, 2011 uh, nuclear, nuclear power plant disaster. So uh, today's a uh, in today's uh, seminar, uh, I would like to talk about a nuclear crisis in Ukraine. Uh, Fahmi, on... stop sharing your screen, Fahmi. Oh, it's okay. Thank you. Uh, can you see the slide? Yes, perfect. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I would like to talk about uh, uh, nuclear crisis in Ukraine uh, based on uh, our experience of the Fukushima disaster. 
uh, <coughs> um, in February, uh, Russia launched a military offensive uh, against Ukraine. This war has been a uh, full scale, a symmetric, symmetric one in Europe, Europe since World War II. As a result, uh, regular armies are severely fighting each other, uh, involving other countries, including NATO and the United States. In addition to table uh, destruction and Yemen's casualties, uh, cruel war crimes against humanity uh, occurred in Ukraine. Furthermore, the Russian armies put Chernobyl and uh, the Polish uh, nuclear power plants in control. Although IAEA is uh, trying to monitor the situation, hazards continue. Also, uh, there is a possibility of even using nu nuclear weapons. Uh, the current situation could be uh, regarded as a nuclear crisis uh, since the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. So uh, I want to uh, believe that uh, no one uses uh, nuclear weapons uh, intentionally. However, uh, in the confusion and the tension, these weapons could be used accidentally as a uh, ex as uh, I described, we uh, humankind have experienced uh, severe nuclear weapon accidents uh, since World War II, such as a uh, Damascus accident in 1980 in the United States. Therefore, uh, therefore, uh, even if any troubles in the nuclear uh, power plants in uh, Ukraine don't happen, I think an accident or accidental use of uh, nuclear weapons is still uh, likely. Uh, if a nuclear uh, disaster occurs in Ukraine, uh, its, co its co consequences will be uh, extraordinary. Based on our experience of Fukushima, uh, psychosocial impacts uh, could exceed physical damages. These impacts uh, might be uh, prolonged for a long period of time beyond our expectations even after the, the end of the war. A returning of uh, refugees should be a significantly delayed due to uh, various reasons, such as uh, fear of radiation exposure and traumatic memories. Also, people should have uh, different opinions on radiation health risks that could fragment uh, original communities. As a result, not only uh, physical damages, such as acute radiation exposure symptoms, but also severe mental health issues, such as a post-traumatic stress disorder and depression, should be uh, induced among uh, affected people. So uh, uh, what did we experience during and after the Fukushima disaster in 2011? And what did we learn from it? Uh, next, I would like to uh, review our experience and the lessons. In 2011, a huge tsunami hit the coastal area in the Tohoku region of Japan. It took about uh, 80,000 lives and produced over uh, 400,000 evacuees. Subsequently, a uh, tsunami attacked the Fukushima nuclear, nuclear power plant, leading to a station blackout. Soon after that, uh, several hydrogen uh, explosions occurred at the plant. As a result, uh, three buildings were destroyed and many uh, nuclear materials were diffused into the air. Uh, immediately after the accident, the uh, central government declared a nuclear emergency state and uh, designated the evacuation zone, uh, expanding it from the initial three kilometer uh, to the 20 kilometer zone for a few days. Almost people are living within uh, 20 or 30 kilometer far from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, fell into a big panic and uh, tried to escape from the plant with terrible fear. Uh, they did not uh, prepare for such a nuclear crisis and they had little uh, correct information about the accident. 
at first uh, they thought they could return to their home in a few days or weeks at the longest. Uh, uh, these are the uh, temporary houses in Fukushima Prefecture. Uh, the evacuation evacuees had to live there for years. Such long-term evacuation were very stressful for eva evacuees, and not a few uh, lost their lives due to the deterioration uh, of their health. Other damage of uh, nuclear disasters were very ambiguous. This picture shows a small town located about 20 kilometers uh, from, far from, far from uh, the Fukushima Daiichi power plant. You can see a house uh, totally uh, destroyed by, by the earthquake, but other houses are not damaged in, uh, were not damaged in appearance. So uh, people could have hope to return to the home but also they were not sure of when they could. In such ambiguous situation, uh, the evacuees had to make, make a difficult decision uh, whether they should return or not. After the disaster, a uh, number of evacuees reached over uh, uh, <clears throat> 160,000 at maximum. As the relief process progressed, including contamination, uh, habitable areas gradually increased. Eventually, nearly 70% of the evacuation area has changed into a habitable one. However, uh, many evacuees, uh, especially young evacuees, are still hesitated to uh, return to ho their hometowns for uh, various reasons. Uh, such as a concerns of uh, financial issues and uh, unclear futures. Uh, this slide show, shows a change in the number of evacuees inside and outside of Fukushima. As you can see, uh, while the number of evacuees inside of Fukushima decreased yearly, uh, though the outside of Fukushima uh, dropped only a little. Even now, uh, nearly uh, 30,000 evacuees Stay, uh, stay very far from the original town. In the initial phase, uh, while most people and experts focused only on radiational health risks, uh, other non radiological health risks were ignored or seldom considered. However, as time passed, uh, various uh, non radiological health problems gradually emerged. Uh, as you can come to the prefectures, uh, uh, Miyagi and the Iwate prefectures, uh, only a Fukushima prefecture has a significant proportion of indirect death, which we call uh, we call uh, disaster-related death, uh, resulting from a long-term evacuation. Fortunately, uh, no one died from a radiational, uh, radiological health effects such as acute expo uh, exposure syndromes or thyroid cancer. However, uh, over uh, 2,000 people died from lifestyle related diseases or mental health problems caused by long term evacuation. Also, a uh, uh, stressful uh, long term evacuation and uh, sometimes made people uh, lose hope and uh, even commit suicide. This slide shows a number of disaster-related suicides in the prefectures. The total number of disaster-related suicides in Fukushima uh, reached uh, 140, which is much higher than those in other uh, prefectures, other affected prefectures. As you can see, uh, different from other prefectures, the number of suicides uh, in Fukushima went to its peak uh, three years after the action. This delayed effect uh, indicates that the people were gradually exhausted and uh, lost the hope uh, during the long term stressful evacuation. 
So the, this uh, shows the comparison uh, between natural and nuclear disasters. There are many differences compared to natural disasters uh, in major nuclear disasters, such as Fukushima disaster, the impact of trauma is more chronic and complicated. In Fukushima disaster, affected area is invisible and unclear. For example, we can we cannot make definite uh, clear borderline between affected and non-affected area. It should be very difficult for evacuees to ask, accept physical losses compared to natural disasters. In addition, uh, widespread public stigma towards radiation exposure and the monetary comp compensation were often induced. Such intense social reactions are almost never seen in natural disasters. Actually, uh, many evacuees have suffered from uh, groundless rumors and public stigma. They were often exposed to prejudice due to uh, misunderstanding radiation, radiation genetic effects or receiving uh, compensation. Therefore, they often hesitated to speak out about their experiences during the disaster. According to our major survey, the prevalence of people at risk of depression is up to five to six percent among affected people. Even 10 years after the disaster, uh, which is about twice uh, that among Japanese gen uh, among the generation population in Japan. Uh, and this uh, shows that uh, the changes of radiation is perception towards genetic effects uh, among evacuees. Uh, the, the proportion, uh, the proportion of the people having uh, uh, concerned about uh, uh, genetic effects uh, is uh, decreasing. But the uh, recent, recent few years, uh, the, the, pro uh, the uh, proportion remain high. And, uh, now about 30% 30, about 30 uh, uh, 30 still have uh, uh, genetic effects. And uh, uh, according to uh, further uh, analysis, uh, we, find, we found that uh, a strong association with uh, uh, depressive states and the perception of radiation risk. In natural disasters, uh, uh, the uh, loss experience, uh, such as house damage uh, or abandonment, uh, should be uh, should be uh, should be the most uh, strong uh, uh, should be the strongest uh, factors. Uh, uh, but that uh, uh, in Fukushima disasters, uh, we didn't find that such a uh, such a uh, uh, results. So uh, we have to uh, uh, conduct uh, uh, not only a risk, uh, risk communications, but also the mental support for the people having uh, strong uh, worries about uh, the uh, uh, radiation effects. So um, nearly 70% of the uh, evacuation order area became habitable again, but due to the contamination, and the relief process, uh, it covers 70% uh, of original community members. However, 40%, about 40% of residents uh, once living there do not still return. So in summary, uh, the Fukushima disaster brought a long-term psychosocial impact, uh, put people in a quite ambient situation, uh, made them leave, leave as refugees for long, period of time. The fragmented original communities and produce expected long-term health uh, deterioration are uh, leading to the death. So uh, and after the Ukraine war, uh, the huge number of people lost their houses and they were forced to relocate across European countries. If a nuclear crisis occurs in Ukraine, furthermore, uh, its impacts uh, should be uh, unimaginable. These impacts also should last for a long, long time. 
So uh, we, Fukushima Medical University, issued a declaration, declaration, uh, declaration uh, regarding the Russian invasion in the intentional uh, international symposium held in spring, uh, based on our experience. Uh, the nuclear disaster should give people intense psychological trauma and the relief process uh, after it uh, should be pretty difficult. We still really hope to avoid it and uh, overcome uh, the crisis. So anyway, uh, considering the current crisis, we might need to make a preparation for a nuclear disaster. This slide shows a part of our WHO framework in, in, introduced by uh, Dr. Hannah Bio. MHPSS is a cross-cutting issue, and therefore effective MHPSS requires an intersectorial uh, sectoral, uh, coordination among diverse actors and stakeholders, even in the pre-disaster phase. Also, uh, coordination and the communication are key to success after a nuclear emergency occurs. After the time, uh, at the time, uh, we need to uh, establish a care network based on the long-term view. As I mentioned before, uh, its impact should be considerably prolonged beyond our expectations. Staff involved in the situation are more likely to be exhausted because they could be exposed to anger or negative feelings among affected people. So we also need to make a support system for various staff concerned as well as residents. Moreover, people feel we are faced too much information about nuclear uh, and nuclear incidents, especially in the initial phase. Uh, people will often return excessively uh, excessively pessimistic idea about radiation health effects through different social media. Like the current COVID nineteen pandemic, we need to help people have fact checking fact checking skills and. Uh, make decisions in a uh, rational manner. One of the critical uh, things we learned from the Fukushima disaster uh, is that uh, only, not only uh, radiation exposure, but also long-term evacuation in, is dangerous for physical and mental health. So uh, we need to emphasize and convey it to the people. So. Uh, uh, we are uh, actually uh, we uh, uh, conducted uh, uh, the mental health support team, uh, uh, which uh, uh, would provide uh, outreach-based uh, telephone intervention. Uh, uh, our team is uh, consisting of uh, consists of uh, seventy staff, including clinic clinical psychologists, social workers, and nurses and the telephone sub supports were provided for the uh, respondents showing the mental health problems. And the, this, these are the, our, uh, our uh, support team. And they are, uh, they are uh, uh, conducted uh, telephonic support for the uh, four and 5,000 people uh, every year uh, based on the results of the, our survey. So, uh, so uh, she is uh, checking, uh, the, uh, checking that uh, she sees uh, identities, uh, see, uh, mm, uh, she uh, uh, identified that uh, uh, list, a list of suicide. But lastly, I, I, I uh, emphasize the uh, uh, exhaustion of uh, relief workers in Fukushima. Uh, we uh, conducted a, a diagnostic interviews, uh, interview surveys for uh, public employees working in the disaster area. Uh, surprisingly, uh, uh, about 80% uh, had uh, uh, serious uh, depressive symptoms and even 9% uh, uh, suicide risks. So uh, they, are, uh, they were exposed to uh, frequent anger or uh, complaints uh, from evacuees. So uh, we, we, uh, we need to uh, efficient uh, support network for the uh, wo workers uh, working for the uh, uh, affected area. Thank you for your attention.
Professor Maida, thank you so much. This is impressive uh, work and uh, and very informative presentation. I uh, I learned a lot also listening uh, listening listening to you, and I'm sure many of the colleagues online. Uh, in fact, I have I have uh, I have a couple of questions to you, and I have a couple of questions to 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 Jeanette, please. And then I think we can open uh, the floor for a couple of uh, questions from the participants before closing the session. First uh, question. Uh, you please is about suicide rates. Both Ukraine and Japan in their respective regions, they are two countries with high suicide rates. And noting also what you have shared with us, both from the affected population and the responders about the suicide rates. Can you tell us what, what is currently happening in Fukushima regarding suicide prevention, please? Yeah, unfortunately, uh fortunately uh we are uh, we are uh, mm, other, uh, very close to success to prevent suicide. So uh, last year uh, we met uh, uh, only four cases, four suicidal, su suicidal cases, only four. So so uh, 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 in my opinion, uh, uh, people are. Uh, 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 having a um, resilience, uh, especially uh, uh, in, the, uh, in this pandemic, uh, they were um, at half of them, uh, uh, based on our uh, results, our surveys, uh, that half of them uh, had no effects uh, of uh, the pandemic. So, uh, so, so uh, the uh, experience uh, of uh, the uh, nu nuclear disasters uh, have, uh, might help them uh, overcome it uh, in a, in a uh, rational manner, I think. Thank you so much. And my second question is about the high percentage of sleeping problems among the responders. More than 70% is quite an eye-opener. How were you able to respond uh, to that? I I hear also uh, the issue of sleeping difficulties because it have also a very a very practical issues related to shellings at uh, night, the safety, the displacement in Ukraine. But it seems from the response in Fukushima that seventy percent was really really huge. What were you doing to address such an issue? Ah uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, sleep difficulties. Uh, uh... Uh, uh, the uh, crucial issues uh, because of, uh, the significalities uh, may produce uh, another uh, health uh, problems uh, such as uh, depression and uh, other uh, physical uh, chronic di diseases. So, and, uh, mm, especially uh, suicide uh, is associated with uh, strongly associated with that. Uh, uh, sleep difficulties, and, and uh, uh, people are often uh, use uh, overuse uh, the alcohol uh, to uh, to get a good sleep. So uh, we are um, three years after the accident, uh, we uh, we uh, we uh, made a plan uh, to uh, to. Uh, mm, to understand the uh, effects of uh, uh, sleep difficulties, uh, so uh, so uh, we are uh, we conduct we are we are conducting a uh, uh, psych uh, psychoeducation, uh, active psychoeducation for them. So sleep is sleep is very important, but so uh, especially Japanese uh, uh, ignore the sleep effects. So uh, I tend to ignore the sleep effects. Uh, and the, the, the people are often uh, hesitate to take uh, uh, medication. So uh, we we are trying we are we are trying to uh, change the uh, change the, the mind uh, of uh, among the uh, affected people. So uh, psychoeducation uh, is uh, very important. 
Professor Maida, thank, thank you so much for the informative presentation and, uh, and for being, being with us today. And I want to move to Jannat uh, for a quick question. Uh, please, can you tell us briefly, uh, what can the mental health and psychosocial support community learn from previous nuclear emergencies? And what can mental health and radiation experts learn from one another? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um. Masaharo, yeah. it's a question to me, but if you want to answer, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, a very good question, Pahmi. In fact, um, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning of our joint presentation, there is a gap between two sectors dealing with nuclear emergencies and other emergencies. And unfortunately, there is a bit um, two silos. So people, these sectors, they are working in silo. So we really need desperately to bridge this gap and to make sure that these uh, two communities are talking to each other and uh, that also that there are established functional links between operational procedures and uh, protocols and arrangements uh, to tackle mental health and uh, psychosocial support, both in disasters, in outbreaks, in any health emergencies, and in nuclear radiological emergencies. So it's not easy to make sure that these two sides talk to each other, but we are trying to do that. For nuclear emergencies, the leading international organization is IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, and in countries, member states of IAEA, basically normative products, uh, international safety standards produced by IAEA, they dictate as a soft law the way how countries organize their emergency and preparedness and emergency response activities. So we need to make sure that these international standards, they incorporate in them provisions for soft concepts for well-being, for holistic approach, for uh, looking at the health impact as a whole, both physical and mental health. And this is still a work we have to do. I remember presenting our framework at the group of nuclear regulators. And one of them, a very old and experienced person, he told me, please don't use the word mental health. It gives an impression that you think that everybody will go crazy from radiation. So there is even stigma against the terminology. And we know that only in the last maybe 10 years and increasingly during COVID, the term mental health in emergencies, it was really put up and uh, came into the focus of the global communities. And it doesn't mean that person has a schizophrenia or uh, some kind of other disorder. It actually refers to our well-being. Uh, it's a very broad term. So I think it is important to make sure that the wording is not stigmatized, that two sectors talk to each other. And also it is important to build trust uh, in the preparedness period. And what I remember uh, from my experience working with Fukushima colleagues after the accident in the, near, in the first two, three years after the response, our colleagues in Fukushima um, University were reporting in one of our meetings or conferences, a very good experience of engaging community into the dialogue and into uh, developing information products together. And in this case, people who were actually affected, they were contributing to development of this product. So they were sharing the ownership of this information. And that really helped to build the trust in for, into this trust, trust to this information and to this information products, yeah. Uh, yeah. which was not the case early in the response. Early in the response, there was a lot of mistrust from the affected people to the government and to the scientists who stood in front of the audience and were saying, you have nothing to worry about. So um, we learn, of course, from past accidents. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeanette. And... Uh... 
I am receiving number of questions here in the chat. I, I think there is one question. I would kindly ask uh, ask Professor Maida to, to respond to very briefly. Uh, Professor Maida, there is a question that came to me about people with severe mental illness in institutions. How did you respond to their needs during the Fukushima emergency? Because we 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 have we have people with mental with mental illness in intranets and also in psychiatric facilities. So how were you able to prioritize their needs during the Fukushima response? Uh, I think that uh, the uh, most most uh, urgent and important things that, and especially in the initial phase, uh, we, uh, we need to establish establish a network to prevent suicide or other uh, self destructive uh, behaviors such as uh, drinking too much. So, so it's. It's a uh, that uh, most proud, uh, the uh, strongest priority, I think, in the initial phase. Thank you so much, Professor Maeda, and I uh, want and 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 and, 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 and uh, uh, if possible, uh, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, long term service uh, in order to to uh, identify the uh, mental health. Uh, current mental health issues and uh, uh, to estimate the uh, effects of the support, uh, such a long term uh, long term service uh, should be conducted after the action. Very, very clear. And thank you, thank you so much for this. And the framework highlighted also specific aspects related to recovery. And I encourage colleagues to to read it in the framework. In one line, I, I I'm going to to cover uh, to cover one line, quick points from my side, and I'm going to Janat, and I'm going to you, Professor Maida, and I suggest this one line as a response to the priorities in preparation for this kind of emergence in Ukrainian context. And also, colleagues, I want to highlight: we don't know if this type of uh, either nuclear accident or nuclear event will happen, but we hope it never happened in Ukraine, and we hope it never happened in any uh, in any country. Uh, we share the message of solidarity that Professor Maeda has shared from Fukushima Medical University that uh, that this uh, this nuclear threat is happening to uh, the war in Ukraine uh, by by Russia due to the current uh, ongoing uh, ongoing war. But we hope that the preparedness we're doing now. We never actually need to uh, to use in uh, Ukraine or any other uh, emergency, but we have to do. We have to do preparedness, and we have to we have to be ready. So, in response to Katrina's uh, question, uh, what is what do we need to prioritize? From my side, the one line would would be coordination, and in preparedness phase, clear plan clearly and involve a clear functional lines of communication, clear operational procedures, and agreed roles and responsibilities among multi-sectoral actors. To you, Janat, what do you think should be the priority in MHPSS preparedness for nuclear emergencies? Well, I agree with you. Uh, coordination between sectors is extremely important, and not only at the national level, but also at the international level. When I visited Ukraine in September, I had meetings with uh, partners, not only national authorities and regional health authorities, but also with our UN partners in the field. And I remember one of the organizations was presenting their response plan, and they were saying that if there was, a, let's say, an explosion, and they were bringing their decontamination tents and their emergency mobility teams, and I was surprised to hear that they included a psychologist into the a mobile emergency team which will be unf unfolded there. They will be doing a triage, decontamination, and immediately psychologists providing, I don't know, maybe it is a, a dream, but this is what they presented uh, in, the, in their slides, that, that, that they plan to do it. And I was surprised because to my knowledge, we don't have that level yet. We do not plan to have a psychologist actually in the field working with people. So that was for me interesting uh, experience to learn. 
Thank you, Janet. And Professor Maida, one point as a priority for pre MHPSS preparedness for Ukrainian colleagues. Uh, I, I also think uh, that uh, coordination is <laughs> important, uh, but uh, it's a, it's a uh, often difficult in the states. So I, I, in my case, I, I felt that uh, we isolated <laughs> in the situation, but uh, uh, we try to make a relation with relationship with uh, 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 other other. Experts are working in other domains. Thank you so much. And I want to give the floor to Katrina to close this session, please. Thank you, all colleagues. We look we look forward to staying to staying in touch. And thanks, Janet, and thanks, Professor Maida. Over to you, Katrina, to close the webinar, please. Yeah, thank you so much, dear colleagues, for this very informative and meaningful. Uh, presentations and uh, the whole discussion. I think it was very useful for our uh, colleagues and the participants of this meeting. We will as well uh, share the presentations with everyone so that they can get back to them. Uh, so thank you very much for having this meeting despite so all the uh like difficulties postponing it and thank you the participants who actually joined us today and managed to listen to this conversation live i think it's a very um crucial and uh, very meaningful topic because uh the most important part i think um for us today should be preparedness. So I kindly encourage all of the colleagues who are on the call to um get back to this framework on MHPSS in radiological and nuclear emergencies, which is available in English and Ukrainian, and to kindly uh, read it and to get it acquainted with it, because, uh, of course, we may hope we will uh, never actually need to use it in practice, but we still need to be prepared, because otherwise uh, we, will, um, we will face many negative consequences so yeah uh thank you very much um dear colleagues uh let's keep in touch and uh, thank you so much uh famish donat and maeta yeah uh, bye everyone thank you and have an amazing rest of the day or a great evening <laughs>